Hello, uh, my name is Mark Richards. I'm the provost and executive vice president uh, for academic affairs at the University of Washington. Um, and I am extremely honored and pleased to be here for this conversation. In May of this year, the Meany Center for the Performing Arts will present the Los Angeles Master Chorale's brilliant production of Lagrime di San Pietro, conducted by Grant Gershon, the Kiki and David Gindler Artistic Director of the Los Angeles Master Chorale, and directed by American theater director Peter Sellers, who is renowned for his innovative, provocative contemporary stagings of classical and contemporary operas and plays. Today is my pleasure to speak with Grant and Peter. Gentlemen, welcome. First of all, can you say something about your history of working together as stage director, choral director, the master chorale, et cetera? Well, I'll jump in here and just say, uh, Peter, I don't know if, you know, if you've done the math, but it's been, we've now worked together for 35 years uh, by my calculations. Uh, it was 1988, uh, China, when it came to LA and I was a lonely <laughs> pianist in the hustle room. And, uh, and it just went from there. And we've done, I mean, just dozens and dozens of projects together. And they're always the, the high points of my artistic experience. So, uh, you know, I have to say when I, when I came to Los Angeles in 1987, we were doing Nixon in China and we knew this opera pretty well because we had created it and done it already in three other cities. And we walked in the room and there was this uh, young man named Grant Gershon playing the piano and we heard music we'd never heard before. It was gorgeous. Grant was revealing our own piece to us. And Grant has a way of seeking out and finding the heart of a piece and seeking out and finding a melody you didn't know was there and opening worlds that are were right in front of you all the time. Grant is the person who opens those mysterious uh, hidden doors. And, and, and so working with Grant across the years is just amazing because it's this going to rehearsals is just this continuous process of revelation. You walk in the room and you think you know what you're dealing with. And then Grant starts and you go, oh, oh. <laughs> and then we're, and suddenly you're in a much more beautiful world than you were in just a few minutes ago. So Peter, slightly on that subject, the range of between John Adams contemporary opera and de Lasso, Italian Renaissance and everything in between is huge. And one of the things that has impressed me about your work with the chorale, the chorale's repertoire is that incredible range. Can you say something about that? Well, John has entrusted so <clears throat> many premieres to Grant and, and, and John has written very specifically both for the Master Chorale and also for Grant as a pianist. And so John and Grant have this amazing connection. And this <clears throat> Orlando de Lasso project uh, ironically came out of um, talking with John Adams. <laughs> I'll let Grant take over because it's Grant's whole thing. But we, this was John's wow. after Dr. Tomic was uh, a kind of continuation of, well, basically a passion, uh, a, a passion uh, uh, of, of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and John <clears throat> Adams always tries to find some completely new harmonic and musical language for every opera. I mean, most composers, you kind of, you've heard one and you know where the rest are going. John, opera by opera, it's a new world. It's a new sound universe. And, and so John was listening to a lot of Orlando de Lasso. Wow. And, and and mentioned that to Grant. And Grant, I'll let you take the ball from here. <laughs> well, yeah, Peter um, Peter and I were working in Santa Fe the summer of 2011 um, on Griselda of All Things by Vivaldi. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, having these conversations with John um, about Orlando de Lasso. And so I started listening to a lot of de Lasso. And I have to say at that point, La Grime di San Pietro was not a piece that was on my radar. And, um, and I was just absolutely bowled over by it. And the more that I listened and studied it, uh, the more it seemed to me that 
this was, I mean, it's, this is the piece it's, it's to the Italian Renaissance, what Bach's B minor mass is to the, the German Baroque. I mean, it's wow. a summation of the entire language and, um, and spirit and spirituality of the era. And, um, and it just seemed to me that, that this was also, uh, you know, something that we could explore in, in real depth. Um, and so Peter, I remember that, that, um, I, we started talking about this and one of the first things that you said is if we were to do this, it would be the hardest thing that either of us ever did in our lives. And I thought that was hyperbole at the time. Thought, oh yeah. Yeah. We've done a lot of hard stuff, but, but that was just scratching the surface. <laughs> I, I have to say, it is immense. one of the things I uh, found myself thinking when I began to watch some of the video of the productions that you've done is what would we have thought in the Master Chorale if we'd been asked to memorize that entire work and stage it at the same time? So you've, you've done extraordinary things with your singers. Uh, and and I, I, I want to ask a little bit about that process of you know, I don't believe that every wonderful chorus singer is accustomed to that kind of performance. And I was wondering, aside from the staging and the creative ideas and so forth, what practically had to happen with this group of singers to make this work? It's an incredible undertaking. Yeah, it is. And it, it, I have to say, I mean, uh, <clears throat> singers, it's, it's an incredible act of bravery as well. Um, and I mean, none of us really knew what we were getting into. Um, I mean, we had a vague idea and certainly the, the singers, you know, they just signed on blindly. Um, but that's been the biggest inspiration uh, to me of this whole project is to see them hurl themselves into this and and do things vocally and um and with their with their bodies and uh, emotionally that uh that I think you know none of us had ever really gone that far before with any piece but that's what that's what Delasso demands of us and uh, and it's just it's all respect and and props to our singers because I mean they are, they are the true heroes of this project they're phenomenal I have to say, you know, first of all, that music has never, ever, 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 ever been memorized in more than 400 years. You know, I'm sorry. No one would ever dream of doing that. It's like, it is so elaborate, it's so detailed, and it's so long. You know, it's a, a me memorizing, uh, you know, an hour and a half of Renaissance seven-part polyphony. Are you kidding? Uh, that is out of the question. So one of the first steps, of course, of staging it was just creating shapes that stayed in the mind, both in terms of musical shapes, but also emotional paths that you're actually, this follows this because in fact, <clears throat> they are linked emotionally and you're actually creating corridors where what it means is to learn. I mean, the expression we say is, is sing by heart. And, and in fact, it's an emotional thing. And once you have an emotional connection to anything in your life, it becomes part of your, your mind, your memory, and, and part of who you are. And so it meant going to that, that kind of place, but I will still never forget when we first did it, um, the singers were just in shock because there was no way they were gonna make it through the night. <laughs> and we just started. And at the end, it finished <laughs> and the audience just went berserk because there'd been silence the entire time, mm. a sound. And an hour and a half later of pure silence, like the singers were just in some other world. Suddenly the audience just started standing and shouting and applauding. The singers just couldn't move. They simply stared ahead eyes blank with total disbelief no one could believe we made it we made it through because wow. there was so much fear trepidation yeah. anxiety everything else so how are we going to get through this thing and now i have to say four years later uh one of the most amazing things is they own this piece they know it inside and out they own it at, you know it's not for me even yeah. just anything they they're <laughs> they've taken it and it is so part of their lives. And because, you know, it's seven part harmony with three persons on each part. So it's a, 
it, the 21 singers have seven pods, as it were, and each trio is in charge of their material. Yeah. And so what's so great is it's not a top-down thing. That It's within each part, those three singers have all kinds of plans together. They figure everything out together. They, they And it's very moving to watch the chorus really take this music on and internalize it. And, 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 and so many of the most, most memorable and beautiful and heartbreaking parts of it are things that people have arrived at themselves. And so Peter, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go, 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 Mark, yes. Let, let's back up a step here. Uh, and I'd like to hear a little bit of, about the emotional power of this work, what attracted, it, ha, attracted you to it. Uh, why you, you've given me, a, I'm fascinated that John Adams steered you this direction, but uh, you still had to choose, you know, to put in a huge amount of work and invest a lot. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, what drew you to this work, the divine eye within the human senses, et cetera, and just the power that underlies this and a, and a little bit of the story for our listeners. Wow. Well, you know, <clears throat> Like Grant said, we all signed on having no clue what we were doing. And I certainly, more than any of them, <laughs> Grant just, uh, I said no to Grant. I mean, Grant was very nice. When he asked me to do this, I said, I'm sorry. That's, you know, Grant told you a minute ago that this is the hardest thing. I told him this is the hardest thing any of us would ever have done. And I said no. And, and then, but Grant knows Julia Carnahan, who runs my life. So at one point, I returned from Europe to find this in my schedule. Next Tuesday night, the rehearsals begin. <laughs> He does run their life. Yeah, no, Grant had made had made a very smooth move. And so suddenly I was in the same situation with these singers, scared out of my mind. What next Tuesday? Are you kidding? So anyway, it was that kind of shock. And and we had to do, you know, two seven part uh uh basically madrigals every night. <laughs> Uh, uh, and we, it was just shocking. And so step one, uh, okay, it's named for Peter. Uh, so, you know, I do know a little something about that guy. Uh, uh, Peter has just said, you know, cops are coming to arrest Jesus. And as they're putting the handcuffs on Jesus, they see Peter standing there and they say, do you know this guy? And Peter says, uh, no. And Jesus is looking directly at him. And then the cops take Jesus away. Now, the incredible thing is that look. What does a look have in it? A look... When somebody looks into your eyes that way, you see that look the rest of your life. This piece is uh, written by a guy named, the, the verses, the poetry are written by a guy named Luigi Tancio, who was a kind of sub petrarchian poet uh, in Renaissance Italy. And he wrote 80 verses of Peter the rest of his life remembering that look when he didn't have the courage to save his best friend from the police. Where again, this guy then was taken away and they never saw him alive again. And the rest of your life, you say, I could have stepped in and maybe helped save his life. And I was too scared. And so, this guy, Luigi Tancio, wrote 80 verses of Peter waking up literally 30 years later in the middle of the night, still seeing that look. That look is compared in this Renaissance poetry to a <clears throat> dagger. The look is, com it, it, it's compared to, you know, the, the divine eye looking right through you. What is the power of the divine eye? When Jesus looks at you, he sees all of you. There's nothing his gaze does not see. And when he asks you that question, just with the look, you spend the rest of your life searching for the answer. Mm -hmm. And Tansio wrote 80 verses 
uh, uh, of course, uh, Orlando de Lasso, at the end of his life, because he was, he died one month later, yeah. he set 20 of these verses. Now, he knew what he was doing. The Inquisition had decided that this was illegal literature. It was placed on the list. So you could actually be brought in and tortured <clears throat> and imprisoned for even having possession of these verses. The idea that, that Orlando de Lasso at the end of his life of one of the two most famous co composers in all of the Renaissance uh, Europe said, this is my last work. And I think he had in mind Peter's sense that across the end his whole life, he looked back and very little of what he saw pleased him, which is incredible from a man who was this successful. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, all of this was vanity and the idea that in fact, he never really succeeded. Meanwhile, uh, interestingly, uh, the, uh, the, the, the story is quite incredible. He was very old and all of his friends had died years before. And Orlando de Lasso simply outlived the Renaissance. Michelangelo had died 30 years before. Uh -huh. Everything was, had moved on and he alone was alive. And he used this music to ask God to let him go let him leave this world. And there's a very little music we have in the history of music that speaks this eloquently and shatteringly about old age and about, you know, as Betty Davis said, it's not for sissies. And what you are really going through. And the music takes you to places that are unbelievably terrifying and real and we're all gonna go through them and we all are going through them now with our parents. And so just to say the music is shocking it's in its intensity. Meanwhile, because of budget cuts, Orlando who had one of the greatest choruses in Europe uh, in the Munich court, um, basically had the had chorus had been, uh, had been uh, uh, downsized and he had by then no chorus who could perform this work. So it was like Bach writing, you know, the B minor mass at the end, there was no performance imagined. There was no group that could have performed it. So it was somebody writing like a letter to the future, the same way Bach's mm -hmm. Art of the Fugue and B minor mass are letters to the future. And, and then literally uh, a week after he finished this, maybe it's two weeks, but, <laughs> he passed away. And literally the day after he passed away, a messenger came from the Vatican to say, you are excommunicated. And Orlando was one day ahead of them. <laughs> and and had, had written something that would survive, <clears throat> but survive mostly as something that was obsessed on in music theory clerk. Uh, circles because the theory of this music is so rich is as grant said it's a compendium of a lifetime of harmonic exploration of the renaissance and and the, the golden music of the renaissance and of course there were two overwhelming renaissance composers one of them was of course palestrina and the other was just Waldo. i mean just but the other was uh, orlando de lasso and i just want to say that the, basically orlando uh was uh, the Bob Dylan to Palestrina's Beatles. <laughs> you know, like Palestrina is wow. the feel good okay, guy <laughs> where all the harmonies just sound great and life is golden. And, 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 and Orlando de Lasso is the dissonance, the disrepair, the wreck, the struggle, the I can't do this anymore, you know, all through his life. He wrote this kind of decadent uh, danger zone in this, this danger zone uh, that he is who he is, and and that the rawness and the honesty of that is incredible. And again, like Bob Dylan, the picture painting is beyond belief, and you're getting this emotional 
you know, thing that is not in, in, in the textbooks at all. You're getting yeah. the emotions that are, you know, not officially allowable. And meanwhile, you're getting harmonic language that is so eloquent and it pours right through your being. You feel it viscerally. These harmonies are so rich and so deep. Thank you, Peter. Grant, far be it for me to ask you to follow Peter's eloquence, but uh, I do, I, I'd like you to follow anything you have to say, but I'm particularly interested in what you have to say about the harmonic content. I mean, I can imagine memorizing the B minor mass or the Verdi Requiem without too much trouble as a singer, but this work, it's almost beyond my imagination how you memorize something like this, much less act it out. Can you say something about those textures and the kind of the, the the musical theory that one might describe underlying this? Yeah, I mean the the music <clears throat> is, is so dense and complex um, because Orlando is struggling with these things that have really never <clears throat> been in music before. And the way that manifests is that all of the seven lines, so backing up again, that there's every one of the 21 pieces in the Lagrime is in seven part um, polyphony. And um, and so that that in itself is just that creates these these incredibly complex textures and and no one line by itself really makes any sense because it's only when you combine things in the total. So it, what it means for the for the singers trying to memorize, this is you can't do it on your own you can't just like you know go into your practice room and and you know you have to be with all of your 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 companions because it doesn't make sense until it's part of the whole part of the 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 the, the fabric of of the piece um so that's that's one thing but you know the the other thing what just following peter on what you were saying is the the revelation to me of the piece as we started rehearsing it was we thought it was about one thing and it is about that it's about the grief and remorse that that peter feels from um from his his failure of courage and um and lack of faith but it is also about growing old and um and it's about as peter you were saying about what it means not only to to lose the people that are close to you, but also to lose your own memory. Uh, and one of the one of the last madrigals talks about the miracles of Jesus, and it talks about them through this musical haze. <clears throat> and, and the point is that that Peter is is trying unsuccessfully to remember. He 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 made the 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 lame to walk. He he made the blind to see. He raised the he raised the spirits from the dead but he can't quite remember this and that's the the heartbreak of that is just unbelievable and and i think for all of us when we started to really discover what the piece is about and it and and it is you know literally about orlando at the end of his life looking back with the same remorse um with the same sense of un finished business of of failure of will mm -hmm. um and that's again peter as, as you were saying this there's, there's very few works of art that i can think of that that address these issues head on the way that this that this piece does there seems to be in what you described thank you grant there seems to be a certain i haven't study this work the way I will between now and May 6th, there seems to be a certain emotional resolution toward the end, a coming to peace or coming to terms, perhaps. And I'm, I have to, if you don't mind my speculating, might part of that, that divine eye and gaze have been realized as forgiveness, understanding that maybe uh, St. Peter only realized in the end, and maybe De Lasso was coming to grips with. Is that is that a reasonable speculation? <laughs> you know, uh, watch this space, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> that is where the piece took us, mm -hmm. and and I have to say the, uh, the <clears throat> we arrived at the end of the piece 
very much as something you can only arrive at when you arrive. You know, you can, you couldn't see it up ahead. You really are literally arrived there and you say, oh, this is the destination. We didn't know that. And, and again, I, I have to say also, just as in the life of St. Peter I had these just incredible moments of vision, but also Peter was, as you know, the most stubborn of the disciples and the most clueless. And Jesus kept having to say everything to him three times. <laughs> you know, because it's like... <laughs> You must no. have been an academic. No. <laughs> he kept saying, feed my sheep. And Peter stared at him. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And Peter stared at him and he said, feed my sheep. You know, it was like, like that kind of thing. And, and at the same time, of course, Peter had these unbelievably thrilling moments of his own divine revelation where he could declare things and understand them suddenly. And, and the music has both of that, both of those things, both things that you're only learning gradually by coming back to it and coming back to it. And other things that are sudden moments where everything opens and you say, oh my God, I understand. I see, I see, I see, I feel it. I understand it. And the music goes back and forth between as we do as human beings, certain things we only learn across our whole lifetime and other moments where suddenly everything is clear. And, and, and Orlando has the musical uh, chops to deliver in both directions. You feel certain things are musically arriving over time and uh, have been built into the, the, the ongoing texture. And other moments, there's no moment like it before or after. And you just go, oh, this is a miracle. This is simply a miracle. And, and in the 21 numbers, <clears throat> there are... You know, there, for example, there's, uh, uh, I mean, one of the most incredible, I think it's number 11 is he describes a snowflake. He says, like a snowflake arriving gently and as it touches the ground, melting. This is what happened to Peter's heart. This is what happened to Peter's frozen heart as the eye of Jesus looked into his heart and his frozen frightened heart melted so orlando gives you this texture of pure winter and paints a winter scene of a village completely under snowdrifts frozen for the whole season <clears throat> and a little snowflake coming down and then gives you this incredible melting and arrival of spring you know, it's just, you know, and that's just, you know, that's number 11. I can't wait for number 11. Of one of 21 numbers. I mean, but, you know, every number has some incredible poetic image that takes you through, you know, worlds. And and the, um, the, the kind of temperature of the whole piece shifts the, 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 the quality of open spaciousness, you know, for example, you know, Peter, after watching, you know, CNN in some <clears throat> sports bar, you know, of seeing Jesus arraigned and, you know, and seeing, you know, the sentence passed and, and there he is in the sports bar with all these loud people at the bar saying, you know, uh, can we help you? Wait a minute. Don't we know you? <laughs> and Peter says, I got to get out of here. And he's freaked out. He's freaked out. And then, Orlando describes Peter walking through the city all night, through alley after alley, kicking over every garbage can and screaming at the top of his lungs in the night. So let me follow on that a little bit. Um, as, as you know, we were greatly disappointed. You were supposed to perform this work three years ago. And <laughs> it was March of 2020, if I remember right. And then COVID came along. I have to say, first of all, I'm amazed, given the difficulty of this work and the way you staged it, that you're still doing it three years later. I suppose maybe a few singers have moved on and switched out in that process. But I'm wondering if you, given the, the passion that you've just expressed for this work, uh, and that we're literally in kind of a post-traumatic, post-COVID world, what, what do you believe this work brings to us now? And perhaps 
because we're a university to our students, to our young people. Grant, you want to take that? Well, sure. You know, it, it's it's interesting thinking <laughs> back three years. So we were in Auckland, New Zealand on March 13th, 2020, performing Lagrime de San Pietro um, as the world shut down. And that was the last thing that we sang together for <laughs> almost three years. And we came back to the piece this fall. Um, and, and of course, the piece has changed because we've all changed. And, uh, and, you know, it sounds trite to say maybe, but it's, it's just the truth that it just deepened in ways uh, for each of us personally that we couldn't have anticipated three years ago. And, um, you know, the, the piece, you know, it talks about being alone and, uh, and being withdrawn from the world. Um, which is which is where so many of us were during this time. Um, and you know, it's 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 there's a lot of it that is about isolation. Um, and at the same time, you know, in you're you're singing about isolation, but there's 21 of you <laughs> all up there on stage together. And so it is also this sense of community. And um, and as Peter was talking about the the final piece and how when we were staging it originally, we couldn't have anticipated where we would arrive. We had to go through the whole process. And, and the final piece is basically just all 21 singers um, in two rows looking at each other and singing each line to each other and coming with each line a step closer and a step closer so that then it ends in an embrace. And, you know, and I think that that, that image of the piece and that physicality, that, that literal embodiment of the music is something that we cherish and something that 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 speaks physically about the the sense of acceptance in the piece and and the sense of of the the music is transporting us somewhere beyond where the where the words could take us alone i mean that's the that's the whole purpose of of music is going beyond what we can express and uh and this this piece really does that and it does it in in a way that's very generous and um and it's that's that's very open emotionally and i think that's that's something coming back to it after the pandemic that is clearer than it could have ever have been before. And maybe Mark, I could add one more thing because what Grant said is true. Dramaturgically, you have this incredible thing that the whole piece is the voice of a single person, but it's sung by 21 people, which goes to, as Grant said oh. so beautifully, none of us are actually alone, but also <laughs> none of us are just a single voice. We all have multiple voices inside of us that are constantly in conversation, constantly trying to deal with everything because none of us are one voice. We're all, we're all conflicted and we all have like so many voices inside. And meanwhile, in fact, we're all in community all the time because guess what? God did not create the world with us alone. I'm sorry, there are all these other people. And so that turns out to be the reality. And so the tension and liberation of never actually being alone while we're trying to describe what one person is going through. And I think most of us think we're the only person going through that. And then you look around and everyone around you is actually also going through it and going through it differently, which is one of the most incredible things about seven part harmony. <laughs> you, you realize that we're actually all singing the same word, but singing it really differently. <laughs> and, and we're all in different places, but actually on the same word. And so that all of those things, uh, when we were making it, it just kept being astounding that the most private, private feelings and thoughts you've ever had are actually, it takes an entire community to express those things. And we're actually all feeling it together. 